and they are, uh, are doing wonderful things, creative things, uh, with their restoration so that the public is able to come in and see what is going on. And if you haven't been down there, I would uh, suggest that you make a trip down. It's on New York Avenue, uh, 1776 New York Avenue, uh, down in Washington. Uh, the uh, topic that uh, Lonnie is going to be talking about today is the restoration, and I had asked him to, uh, to spend a lot of time on the archaeology because it's fascinating the things that they have found down in the basement. And so I'd like to, uh, to turn the meeting over to Lonnie, and he will have slides. After the meeting, uh, we invite you to come out and have refreshments. Uh, there will be a question and answer period after he's finished. Lonnie? Thank you, Joyce. How many have ever been to the Octagon Museum? How recently? Last year? Three years ago. Three years ago. Well, I encourage all of you to visit the museum before, I would say, the beginning of November, because it will be a unique opportunity for you to see the before, and then in a year, to really see the after. Um, the slides that I'll be presenting today uh, will be in a very good introduction to the house, the, its history, and the work on the restoration that we are doing. Uh, for some of you who have never been to the Octagon, I hope this will whet your appetite to come and see more. The goal that we have while we're doing the restoration is to keep the building open as much as possible so that visitors can come into the house and see the restoration process as it evolves because we think that uh, while a house is undergoing the restoration, that's the most interesting period in that house's history. Um, and as you'll see from the slides that I'll be presenting, uh, the Octagon has had some previous histories of restoration and repair work. What I'm going to do is, because we're uh, lacking remote, I'm going to sit back here and run through the slides. Uh, they go rather quickly and allow you to focus rather than on me talking up front more on the images, which is what I think you came here to see. White House, there sits another house, the Octagon, which for nearly 200 years has seen presidents come and go and has witnessed the transformation from our country from colony to world power. The house, as I said, is the Octagon, and it stands as gateway to our past and symbol of our commitment to architectural excellence. Building on excellence. This is the vision that fuels the work of the American Architectural Foundation, headquartered at the Octagon in Washington, D.C. The mission of the foundation is to create a link between architecture and the public. This mission is no better served than its campaign to complete the restoration of the Octagon. An ambitious undertaking the restoration will not only set the standard for architectural preservation in the years to come, but more importantly, help us learn about our early years as a people and a nation. The Octagon's role in American history is nearly inseparable from the people and events of late 18th century America. It begins with George Washington, who, eager for the territory of Columbia to become a capital city, encourages his friend and fellow Virginian, John Taylor III, to build his home in the new capital city. Taylor commissioned renowned designer and first architect of the capital, William Thornton, who rejected the ornate Georgian style of the time to design a house of elegant proportions and simple classical forms, the perfect, of ex perfect expression of what will later be known as the federal style. Completed in 1801, as a winter residence and shown here in an 1813 illustration, the Octagon quickly became a meeting place frequented by presidents and statesmen. It was here that Taylor, along with his wife, Anna Ogle, of the Ogle family of Maryland, raised 15 children. 13 survived infancy and 11 lived to, to adulthood. In August of 1814, the British burned the capital city but spared the Octagon. President and Mrs. Madison gratefully accepted Colonel Taylor's offer to use the Octagon as a temporary residence. Later in this circular library on the second floor, at this table, the Treaty of Ghent was signed, putting an end to the War of 1812. 
Sometime after 1818, the Talos moved into the octagon permanently. Our goal is to restore the building to its appearance during the 1801 to 1828 Talos family occupancy. To assist the restoration, thorough research has been undertaken and conducted to fully understand everyday life in the Talo household. Archaeology is being undertaken to discover and preserve the surviving physical evidence underground pertaining to Talos slaves and servants in the basement area. Between 12 and 24 servants and slaves are known to accompany Talos to the octagon each fall season. Family letters that survive not only give us a glimpse into their lifestyle, but help us to answer questions assisting the restoration. One of the Talos' sons, Harry, wrote in 1870, in the basement is the housekeeper's room, storerooms, wine cellar, servant's hall, kitchen, with a well of fine water and pump in it at that time. Excavations completed during 1991 and 1992, during those summers, have discovered various features of the water distribution and drainage system. And this feature that you see here in the slide is part of a brick drainage conduit that you see right there in the corner. Shown here in this slide is in the center hallway is part of the unusual drainage feature in the top of a well or sister. The drainage system appears integral to the house, but it's not understood at this time. The well or cistern is likely contemporary with, ta with the Talo occupancy and was filled in after 1867 based on artifacts that were found in the top layers. It may contain further deposits from the adjacent servants hall and thus provide an important adjunct to those excavations that we plan to do in the servants hall later this fall. Organic material encountered during 1991 suggests excellent preservation. However, the excavation of the well or cistern has not been completed because of a lack of available funds. What you're looking at here, the bottom surface, is just coal ash. And we excavated down uh, the depth of this is about three feet so far. And within that coal ash, we found a number of artifacts, uh, leather, wood, fabric, chalk, glass, pottery, um, and plaster fragments. Adjacent and connected to the center hallway is part of the dry storage room. This view that you, we're standing in the dry storage room looking into the center hallway. During this past summer, this entire room was excavated, discovering an original brick drain that you see at the bottom edge of the slide here, going towards that room underneath these pipes that date to 1969. This brick drain is very different from others encountered through the rest, rest of the basement. And the drain may originate in the servant's hall, which here's looking the opposite direction. There's that drain again. And there's a doorway that's been blocked up with concrete block that led to the original servants' hall. And that drain may originate from that room. And further investigations later this winter hopefully will determine where that drain is coming from. As part of the work, I'm Who's sorry. Who's doing the archaeology uh, work? Who's doing the archaeology work? Um, last summer we had a crew from University of Maryland completing the archaeology. This summer we have a crew from American University and University of Virginia. As part of the work completed in 1969, the servants' hall was turned into a mechanical room. And this is the door leading from the servants' hall into the service, or into the center hallway. Later this year, all this equipment and a concrete slab as the floor will be removed and we hope to continue investigations to learn more about the persons who are essential to the functioning of the octagon but whose lives and work experience might otherwise remain hidden from view. The service stairwell has yielded additional evidence of servant activities. It is thought that a water closet and internal sewer system, innovative features for the, for the time, may have been located here in 1800. And what you see in the corner in this kidney-shaped soil depression may be the evidence of early water closet mechanisms. The pipe obviously is 20th century, and this um, rectangle of gray soil to the bottom right is the bottom edge of a mortar bed, which was the original brick floor <coughs> in the service stair. And that brick floor was six inches lower than the floor from 1969. Um, the reason we think that a water closet may have been in this location 
um, are for a couple of reasons. Although Thornton's original plans do not exist for the octagon, earlier sketches by him as well as sketches by Benjamin Latro place a water closet in a similar area in the floor plans. Outside the house and to the rear of the building is an open areaway, which is at the same elevation as the basement floor. Earlier restoration efforts in the 1960s exposed, but did not disturb extensive archaeological features and possible garbage dis deposits in this area. And this area may be disturbed by future mechanical and utility lines, so we hope to conduct further investigations into this area um, later this winter. Now, over the years, the Octagon ceased to exclusively serve the Taylor family. After Ann Taylor died in 1855, the surviving oldest son, Benjamin Taylor, inherited the Octagon. He also had a house on President Square, which is now known as Lafayette Square. But both were neglected after the Civil War. And we had a very large question as to why. Recently, a letter that Benjamin wrote to his daughter's husband was found. And it was dated October 1868. And he gave us a very good reason why both houses were left to neglect. And he said that, um, as soon as I can get away from here, I shall have to go south. The Almighty, man, and the devil are all appear to be against us poor Southern people. <laughs> Apparently, after the Civil War, there was a high anti-South sentiment, and anything associated with Southern families or Southern property um, were left in almost ruin or neglect. And that was the case with the Octagon and Benjamin's own house on Lafayette Square. When the American Institute of Architects leased the building in 1898, they found it in a state of near ruin. This was one of the upstairs bedchamber rooms. The Institute purchased the building in 1902, and the essential restoration work began almost immediately and continued off and on throughout most of this century. Stairs and walls were structurally reinforced. The entire second and third floor story floors were replaced. This shows the original framing, and this shows steel work that was put in underneath the floor framing of the first floor. Unfortunately, all of this steel that was put in has been too rigid, and all of this work is leading up to what is today a major campaign to further the interior and exterior restoration of a treasured national landmark. The act of restoring a 200-year-old house is a challenging and meticulous process, requiring the unique talents of specialized craftsmen in traditional crafts like removing bees, for example. <laughs> Two beehives were on each end of the building. This is on the east end, and another one is on the, the north end. A special beekeeper came to extract the colony. This shows one half of the colony on one side of the building. Um, just for historical sake, we of course had to use a beekeeper named John Quincy Adams. <laughs> And he came and extracted the colony from the eaves of the exterior cornice. And it was estimated that the hives contained over 120,000 bees total, 60,000 bees in each hive. The restoration craftsmen also take us back to a time when building elements were individually crafted, as in the window and exterior woodwork restoration. Because the building has a curved front facade, all of the windows and doors for those round rooms are individually carved so that they curve along with the walls of the building. Basically, in the restoration of this work, it's all hand tools. The repairs are done by removing the paint, sanding, and carving pieces of wood to fit where damaged or rotted wood needs to be replaced. We try and maintain as much original material as we can with all the work that we're doing at the Octagon. We're not making the windows look brand new, but preserving the, the material that's there. Once repairs are made to the window frame, old glass is put back in, or if necessary, replacement glass is made by the original methods. The windows are then reglazed, repainted, and reinstalled. In August of 1991, investigations discovered evidence of the original shingle roof, wood balustrade, Philadelphia gutter, and cast lead flashings, all installed between 1815 and 1818. This hipped roof replaced the earlier flat roof that still survives in the building and serves as the attic floor currently. The physical evidence of nail holes found in the original sheeting boards helped determine the original roof details of the shingling patterns. Sheeting boards were also removed around the perimeter 
and that discovered material hidden within the cornice cavities around the building. And all of those artifacts have been collected for further study and relate in many ways to the various tenants of the building over the years. This gives an idea. In this one cornice cavity, the board that you see here, that this bottle is sitting on, is part of the original cornice. And when the roof was added between 1815 and 1818, the workmen put a wood sill in place and then rested these rafters right on that wood sill and they do not rest or bear on this wood part of the cornice. You can slide a sheet of paper underneath each one of those. But what happened with one of those workmen is they had their lunch and left one of their bottles from their <laughs> beverage behind. And we found evidence of oyster shell, orange peels, um, other pieces of the, the workmen's craft. We found a, a tar bucket that they had left in between one of these cornices. But around at the back, we had larger cornice cavities where they extended the cornice around the building, and this dates to when the roof was added. And located in this cavity, as many others, were fragments of the, of the life from people in the building. Because at the top of this sill plate was a, a space where someone who was sweeping the attic could put a dustpan and dump anything that they wanted down into these cavities, out of sight, out of mind. And so we had evidence wine bottles from late, 18th, or late 19th century wineries in Washington, D.C. We had medicine bottles. This uh, book that is in here was printed in the Octagon when the U.S. government had hydrographic offices in the building for 13 years in the 1870s. We also found an entire men's grooming set. And you see this little yellow handle um, item. That's part of a ivory-handled brush set. This is one of the brushes. We found a comb in another cavity. We found a fingernail pick in another one. We found a smaller fingernail brush in another one. It was as if someone stole this set and hid them in each of the cavities very deliberately. Very unusual. We also think that there might have been some wild goings on in the attic because it was a girls' boarding school during the Civil War. And we found women's stockings in the same cavities where there were wine bottles. So we wonder that uh, the life in the attic was quite lively at points. But from the information gathered as part of these investigations, the restoration team have completed the specifications and design for the new roof. With the roof and wood ornamental balustrade restored, the change for that roof will be very dramatic. Here you see one of the architect's drawings that shows the wood balustrade based on the investigations that were found and based on physical evidence surviving on the sheathing boards, on the chimneys, and on the rafters. The work completed so far has involved locating cypress wood and making new shingles for the roof. We've also been producing cast lead for the flashing in the gutters and restoration of the chimneys. An excellent source of cypress wood for the shingles was located along a river in Florida's Panhandle. The old growth cypress logs sank on the way to their mills uh, probably about a hundred years ago when they were harvested. They sank because um, the wood was so dense and hence the name for those types of logs known as sinkers. And the sinkers were dredged up and have been fashioned into our new shingles and ridge boards. Shown here, original fragments of the cast lead were used as part of the scupper for the original flat roof. We also found fragments of the cast lead used for the flashing for the later roof. And based on these fragments, in order to restore the gutters and flashing, we had to import cast lead from England because the historic material is not available in this country. Experts from England came and installed the lead and also instructed and trained American craftsmen in the lost art of installing the cast lead. And what's unusual about this roof is that, um, to the best of our knowledge, this is the only uh, roof system with the original drainage uh, system that has been installed in this country so far. And what I'd like to do is do a quick uh, run through on the roof restoration because it's quite fascinating. What you see in this picture, Brian, I love the names for the two English craftsmen that came. This is Brian Waterfield, and his boss was Paul Cornfield. <laughs> uh, but Brian is installing part of this cast lead on what is known as a diverter board. And we found original fragments of these diverter boards. And when diverter boards are nailed onto the roof, they channel the water or divert it to the downspouts. And that system is known as a Philadelphia gutter. Or in Philadelphia, it's known as a pole gutter. <laughs> and he's nailing on this cast lead sheet 
to the diverter board. And this is where the only section of the lead is attached in any way to the roof. All of the rest of the lead that you will see is held in place by gravity. Because of some of the connections of lead to lead have to be um, welded, or this hot work is done off the building, off the roof, uh, to ensure against the threat of fire. And uh, part of this stems from a disastrous fire that occurred in England that totally destroyed one of their manor homes. Because of simple repairs for lead work were being done, uh, some sparks caught the dry wood, and uh, through a matter of, uh, of minutes, the roof was in flames, and through a series of mistakes, um, the, the wrong fire crew was called, and the right fire crew was called, they got lost, the curators were more concerned on getting objects out of the house than fighting the fire. Um, through a, a number of these mistakes, they lost the entire building. So all of the hot work was done off the roof in a special protected uh, fireproof uh, works, work area. Here's Paul. Uh, installing the lead and what they do is they lay sheet to sheet and you can see one of the uh, joints sheet to sheet and then this yellow tool that he has it's made out of uh, resin and normally they would have used boxwood wood uh, but boxwood is not available so they use these resin tools and it's known as a dresser and he literally pounds this lead to shape over the sheathing boards over the cleats and around the elements that um, he's working the lead so here's Paul dressing the lead and installing that. Here is one of the downspout sections before it is installed. And you can see this funny little, you know, the wide funnel at the top. And then you can see this funny little crank. Um, that's in order to get it through the cornice. And here's Paul dressing that section to fit it down through from the roof sheathing boards through the cornice to meet up with one of the downspouts. Here's one of the downspots and the lead work, working around it. And you also see at the very top of the slide uh, this darker piece of, of cast lead. What we've done is because the, the new wood shingles have natural acids in them, if we were to let the shingles just sit on this roof, the acids would drip with rainwater down into the cast lead and eventually etch a nice line through the lead, ruining that lead. Um, so what we've installed is a sacrificial piece of lead at the top. It's held in place by these little clips, and that clip is what you see right above the downspout hole. And this piece of milled lead um, has a life of about 70 years, which is about the life of these cypress shingles. And that will absorb the etching process from the shingles. And then when the shingles need to be replaced in about 70 years, which is the minimum life, they may last a little longer. The, um, the shingles will be taken off, the milled lead will be taken off, a new piece of milled lead installed, and then another 50, 70 years of shingles. The, the minimum life for this lead is 100 years. And in some places in England, they have lead that's going on a 1,000 year history. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting to know about milled lead, is, it is, or about cast lead, it is almost an entirely recycled product. 90% <coughs> of lead is recycled lead, only 10% is new. So they, a lot of the lead that is in our lead now is really European or English lead, uh, following really in the tradition that the Talos um, had when this lead was originally installed. Mm -hmm. This shows part of that, uh, all of that lead work in place, the milled lead over top the cast lead. And you also see the base of one of the chimneys at the top left of the screen. And this new piece of wood replicates an original piece of wood that was found on another chimney. And this is a can strip to help divert the water away from the base of the chimney towards the downspout. We also, in this slide, you can see another chimney, and you can see the original piece of wood or the can strip that's at the base of the chimney. And this craftsman is taking modern sheet metal and doing modern flashing, a step flashing, up the base of the chimney. Underneath all the flashing is modern flashing, and then for appearance's sake, the cast lead original historic flashing is done over top of it. So we have uh, sort of the appearance is kept, but we have uh, a backup system for the flashing to ensure the integrity of the roof uh, from future leaks. And this shows in that same location the shingles in place. The step flashing is underneath the cast lead flashing that's at the base of the chimney. And you see in this slide, at the base of the slide at the bottom right, you see the support for a bracket 
that will hold the balustrade in place. We did a mock-up of the balustrade uh, February of, of this year. And this shows it in place. This was before any of the roof was done or before the, the Philadelphia gutter system was done, so it's sort of sitting up on this, uh, uh, not on the brackets that will be uh, done. But when the roof is finished, uh, the balustrade will go back on. The balustrade is being fabricated as we speak and uh, will most likely be installed in December of this year. This point, let me change the slide trays. Um, Matthew Mosca is the paint store who has been doing all of our research since 1983. He's been working now for over nine years, applying traditional and state-of-the-art techniques in an effort to restore the original colors of the house. The process that he uses requires scraping paper-thin paint samples off interior and exterior sections of the house, samples which will later be subjected to ri rigorous microscopic tests to determine date and properties of the original paint. Typical of the challenges he faced, the original colors and ornamental detail on this arch are buried under at least 38 layers of paint. Mm. In removing these accumulated paint layers, we have discovered that the composition ornament that was used when the building was built is probably the very best quality that one will ever see. So it's extremely important to remove the overlayers of paint to restore the character of the original decoration. The restoration of the octagon continues to shed new light on history and structure of one of the finest examples of domestic federal architecture, but work is far from complete. There still remain serious moisture problems, and this is moisture problems resulting from a mechanical system in the attic. It has leaked, causing mold and mildew growth through the plaster. Woodwork needs stripping, repair, and replacement. Structural inadequacies in the house must be addressed if the house is to endure another 200 years. The house is very much an artifact. We treat it as a collection object, and therefore we must look at it as we look at any object within the historic house. As we might look at a piece of furniture, we conserve it, and we address its needs and its maintenance. But we look at it as the most important and precious artifact. The campaign to restore the octagon is not simply a campaign to restore a house, but also a campaign to build on the important work of the American Architectural Foundation. Work expressed through ongoing research and educational programs, through the Architectural Prints and Drawings Collection, and the Octagon's second floor museum galleries, now temporarily closed, but which feature changing exhibitions relating to architecture, decorative arts, and Washington history. The octagon is a symbol of the American Institute of Architects, but it's also a very significant part of our architectural heritage. Over 90 years ago, AIA rescued a house lost in the rush of history. And in the process, it articulated the need to preserve our past, and it was a vision forged by the architectural profession, but one that must now be fulfilled by profession and public alike in common partnership. For if we are what we build, then the octagon holds within its walls the very best of what we are as a nation. Our pride in our country's history, our love of home and place, our admiration for grace and beauty, our passion for excellence, and if past is prologue, let us st study our past and preserve it for future generations and build upon this excellence. So that 200 years hence, the octagon can look out to an America informed by its history, fueled by its vision, and graced by its design. Now with that, it, I draw to a close, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have that some of this some of these slides may have uh, raised questions with you. Is, is the roof complete now? The roof is not complete. We, um, I would say about 80% complete with the roof. If you stand across the street from the outcome and look up at it right now, you see lots of shingles in place, but you also see lots of what appears to be rubber tarps running along the ridges, and the whole back side is not completed. Um, we have, uh, we, basically ran out of shingles and, and
and needed to, to order more shingles from Florida. So we have those shingles drying basically in the front yard right now. And um, when we get closer to November, uh, we'll begin the finishing the roof. There are a couple of reasons why we have to wait. Half of the mechanical system is currently in the attic. And we have to remove that mechanical system the way it came in, which came in through the roof. And so the museum collection is being moved out at the end of this month, and then the staff is being moved out at the beginning of November, and then we can begin demolition work on that mechanical system. And that system will be cut up and taken out through the uh, roof as it uh, went in, and then we'll be able to finish work on the back side. I'm interested in the moisture problem that you had. You said that was the problem. Was that the mechanical system? But we, we actually had two kinds of moisture systems. We had that from the mechanical system itself and that from rising damp, <coughs> moisture coming up through the ground. A concrete slab that was put in in 1969 pushed all of the moisture from uh, past the vapor barrier to the stone walls. And we had rising damp that was going up as far as the second floor. Uh, we've taken two thirds of that concrete slab out. Now we have the last section of concrete to take out this fall, which is in that mechanical room. And we'll be able to not only do archaeology but deal with the moisture problem from the ground. But the mechanical system that was installed in 1969 um, has given us a lot of problems with moisture because, as a cost saving device, they did not insulate the ducts. <laughs> and so all the condensation that forms around the ductwork drips yeah. through the plaster, causing mold and mildew sure. through the plaster, not just on <coughs> the surface. And that's a major thing that we'll be dealing with this fall and winter. Would you say that in an old house that age, whatever, 1880, whatever, it would be better not to put a concrete floor in? I mean, just leave that bare, old, beaten down dirt floors in those things and have, you know, where the water could be absorbed instead of going push What would you say? Um, the system that we're planning for in, our, in the basement now, we do not anticipate putting a concrete slab back down the big here because we have a problem with rising damp, uh, rather than causing the problem to get to the first floor or the second floor to evaporate and deal with that at source. Well, I mean, any old so, house that used to have, you know, the dirt floors in there, what, that were just, what, it, it's better not to put a concrete? Some purists would say it's better not to put a concrete and let the house live as it always has, without the con concrete and then it evaporate on its own. Um, I think what's crucial to any basement is to keep air flow moving, whether you have a concrete floor or no, no concrete floor. You need to keep moisture down there, or keep air down there so that the moisture doesn't get out of control and cause mold and mildew or, or rising damp problems. Yes, sir. To avoid moving the mechanical system, have you ever considered putting in a lake tub underneath like they do in showers? Um, we actually installed a, an emergency overflow drain pan under the mechanical system, and that cannot take the condensation, so we have an emergency to the emergency. <laughs> <laughs> and just to safeguard it, we even alarmed the emergency emergency overflow, so that if it overflowed too much, it would shut the system off. Um, the problem with the mechanical systems being installed in the house is that every 20 years, mechanical systems are upgraded and replaced. And in the last 90 years, um, three five mechanical systems have been in the house. And every time a new system comes in, they just plow new holes through the, the original fabric, leaving the old left in place in many cases. And so uh, to preserve the building, what uh, we are doing is removing all the mechanical systems and putting the actual equipment in an underground vault outside the building. So that in 20 years, when this system needs to be replaced again, and it will, they just peel back the sod, lift up the cr concrete top to the mechanical vault, hoist out the old equipment, put in the new, so that the ductwork remains in place and it will be insulated this time. And so that we do not have to plow through the building uh, once again. So that's something that we are, are going to address as the future maintenance and dealing with it. Because we won't be the last architects or our last people. And just to sort of give you my background so that you know where I'm coming from, I am an architect that is specialized in preservation work, but I'm serving as the owner's representative in this case. Um, I'm a preservation coordinator, and I serve in the traditional role of clerk of the work. So I'm documenting all the work that's going on, but I also coordinate the restoration with the architect that we have selected and with all the craftsmen that we've selected. So 
So it's a very unique position where I'm basically the owner's representative, but I work very closely with the architects and the contractors. And so sometimes I refer to myself as the three-legged beast <laughs> because it's very rare to be able to work within each of those uh, uh, portions within the traditional project. Now, all the vegetables are going to be buried in the garden. No, not in the garden because um, we're, that mechanical vault will be along New York Avenue oh. on the front end uh, so that um, the access is much easier. And we conducted exterior archaeological investigations this past summer in that area to determine if any archaeological features were there. Yeah. Yes, Why weren't you complete the work on the basement? That's a question that's in limbo in the basement. Um, what's interesting is that the basement is going to be the most dramatic change in this restoration. Because in 1969, um, the mindset was not there to restore servant's hall, the dry storage room. They did do a restoration of the kitchen and the wine cellar, but that was the extent. They turned the housekeeper's room and another dry storage room into toilet rooms. And so now in the 1990s, it's much more of an interest from the public's point of view and historians on this cultural diversity, knowing that a house like this in Washington could not have functioned without slaves and servants. And we know more about that component for the Taylor family. And so the plan is to restore the servants' hall and the housekeeper's room and use that as an interpretive center, restore the storage rooms and the kitchen and the center hallway, um, and preserve these archaeological features. However, in the current restoration, the funds that we have for archaeology has come under internship programs. And we budgeted about $40,000 for intern programs, and we've roughly spent almost two-thirds to uh, three-quarters of that amount. And so there will be sections of the archaeology that we will not be able to fund now, and we'll have to hold off until we get additional funds. Um, some the, the money that we are raising, we're raising $4 million for the restoration of the Octagon. 3.7 of it has been raised or pledged, and we have another $300,000 to go. We have a deadline by December 1 in order to meet the Kresge Foundation grant. And so we have a couple of hard months ahead of us. Um, but what I think is, is quite unique is that we kicked off this campaign in October of 89 when the recession began. And a segment of the employment field that has been hardest hit by this recession are the building trades and architects and they have been the most generous to our campaign. Um, so that is uh, uh, very enlightening from the significance of the building. Uh, we hope that additional funds through uh, corporations, foundations, uh, national trust, we have a grant application in, and private individuals themselves uh, contribute to the help of the archaeology. Really astounded that you're taking all that steel out of the building. I mean, it was all there, put in there in 1969, and they didn't realize what was going to happen. Well, um, there have been two generations, actually. I'll go back in 1910 when AIA did the first restoration campaign. Their goal was to preserve as much original material as possible, and the work that they did in 1910 was restoring the entrance hall floor marble tile that was originally in the floor had been pulled up about 1855 by the original family when they were turning it into a rental property. And AIA knew that if they put the tile back down on the, on the wood floor, it would probably rack and move and break as probably why they took it up in the first place. So they took out the timber framing and they put in a concrete slab. The concrete was still working in the same compressive stress or force as the wood framing did. So that was a, a very compatible restoration attempt using modern materials to replace the original, because the original had suffered, most likely. Uh, sometime in the mid-1920s, they did some restoration work, putting in riveted steel under the dining room floor to shore that up, because it flexed a bit too much for comfort. And they kept all the original framing there and just added two supplemental uh, hmm. riveted steel beams. And then about 1954 is where the big change came. This is when preservation uh, philosophy really changed from preserving what was there, keeping it intact, or returning it to its original appearance. In the 1950s, um, influenced by work done at the White House and work at Monticello, the uh, focus was more on maintaining a historic appearance rather than on the original fabric. And so in 1954, 
1954, they shored up the entire staircase. And they did work that really preserved the building. So if they didn't do this work in 1954, the house really would have collapsed. The main staircase had, had detached from the walls and settled two to four inches. So they shored that up, reattached it to steel within the walls. But at the second floor, they removed all of that wood framing and put in steel and metal deck with concrete. And then at the, in the basement, uh, or on the first floor, in the basement ceiling, at least in the kitchen area, underneath the dining room, they took out the primary and secondary structural needs and put in steel, causing the second floor and at the basement, the basement ceiling and the first floor, the structural system became too rigid and the house could not move or expand as it had, had been used to for 150 years. And so the cracking thing that you saw on that one slide through the masonry that has occurred on the outside has been because once all that steel and concrete, it, it caused it to be too rigid and resulted in the cracking through the masonry. And then in 1969, they removed the entire third floor and put in steel and wood decking. Not as much steel and concrete as the second floor, but they did do some. And so a big portion of this next phase that we're entering, and that's why I mentioned the come before November, is that during October, all the collections are being moved and the staff's being moved out. And in November, the demolition work begins, taking out the mechanical system and taking out the entire structural steel in the second floor. So at some point, again, we'll be able to stand on the first floor and look up to the third floor ceiling, or at least to the underside of the third floor. We won't be able to take out the second and third floors at the same time. Uh, the house will collapse. So it's going to be unique phasing for that demolition work. And the interior phase that we're entering into, um, we've broken it down into three phases. First phase is the demolition work. Second phase is finishing the structural and um, putting in a mechanical system. And third phase is dealing with interior finishes, paint and plaster and wall and that sort of thing. So um, in November, everything but the entrance hall of the house will be closed for the public for the demolition work. And it may remain that way for the next nine months to a year. We're not really certain of the time frame. Uh, the plan is, however, to keep the entrance hall open to the public, have uh, videotaped an entire tour of the house prior to removing the collection so we can you know, see the, these rooms furnished. And the tour will change from fo focusing on the interior to focusing more on the exterior. And to answer <coughs> your question more for, for, for your, about when is this restoration going to be complete, the exterior work should be completed by the end of the year. Uh, we were aiming for the scaffolding to come down December 1. It looks like it will come down December 31st. Um, so the, uh, we'll be finishing the fall, or finishing the roof this fall, finishing the balustrade. Um, we are now repointing the exterior masonry, and uh, that repointing work is about three quarters of the way finished. And then the remaining things that will be left to do can be done without the scaffolding on the bottom of the shutters and the front portico reconstruction of the back court. So exterior work should be done by the end of the year and interior work will go for another year, year and a half. So and much of the building uh, for safety's sake will be closed to the public during that time. Yes sir. Is the foundation doing any architectural exhibits at the new office building while the museum is closed? Um, yes, the um, foundation has a very extensive exhibitions program. And when the exhibit galleries were open in the Octagon, we were also conducting exhibitions over there. There's always been a focus that the Octagon had a more historical nature exhibitions, and the AI headquarters had more contemporary. And um, though because of the different buildings, those type of exhibits suit those buildings appropriately. And the Foundation will continue to be working on exhibitions at the AI headquarters. And we also are moving into a period where we have we're entering into an extensive traveling exhibition program. We had last year an exhibition on the history of the White House, and that <coughs> will be traveling for the next two years. There are two different, um, actually they're the same, it's the same show, but two sets of the same show are traveling to presidential libraries and sites all around the country. And then we will be uh, working on some other traveling exhibitions. When this whole restoration is completed, a traveling exhibition will also be put together about this whole process, because um, that is what we've been involved in the public with, uh, the whole restoration, to inform them on the process of the work. If you, come, you know, if you came down this summer, 
You'd see the archaeologists digging in the basement, and you'd see the things interpreted there, the archaeology. Um, we still have a lot of things to find out about the basement, especially in the servants' hall area and the rear area way. Um, and so we still have just pieces of the puzzle right now. We still don't uh, know how it all fits together. Uh, we think we may have two different periods of cisterns or wells. One may relate to the construction period of the house, which is 1799-1801, and the other may relate to the occupancy of the house, which is 1801 and after. And the water closet that you saw obviously uh, relates to the occupancy of the house. So I encourage you in the next month if you get a chance to come in. The museum is open Tuesday through Friday, 10 to 4, Saturday and Sunday, 12 to 4. We're always closed on Any other questions? Thank <laughs> you.